Europe is feeling this most acutely. They have a huge reliance on Russian, Russian gas. Becoming a carbon neutral country. And the president has a goal of getting to 100% clean electricity, meaning zero carbon emitting electricity by 2035, and to cut our CO2 emissions in half by 2030, and to be net zero by 2050. I know I could go on and on, I'm sorry. This is such a long <laughs> no, answer, but I'm telling you, we are, we are on it and we are <laughs> rocking and rolling to be able to build a, a cleaner uh, energy system in the US. Hello, I'm Bonnie Urbe. Welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. This week, we speak with the U.S. Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm. She was appointed to that position by President Biden last year. At the Department of Energy, we have the solutions to tackle our climate emergency and to create healthy, safe, and thriving communities. I'm Jennifer Granholm. And I am so proud to be the next secretary of the Department of Energy. Let's get to work. The Department of Energy maintains the country's nuclear infrastructure. It suggests energy policy in conjunction with Congress and funds scientific research. Previously, Granholm was the governor of Michigan. So welcome, uh, former governor, governor, current energy secretary Granholm. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, uh, and it's a propitious time, too, to have you on uh, with the war in the Ukraine going on. Um, we, a couple of questions about our use of Russian gas. We were energy, uh, we were a net exporter of energy, uh, which I believe that began under President Obama. And it was because of fracking, which of course environmentalists don't like, but that's what got us there. Last year, we imported several hundred thousand uh, barrels of oil from Russia. Why is that? We, we are actually still a net exporter of both oil uh, and gas. Uh, we, we are blessed with abundant resources, including, including fossil fuel. Your department is particularly critical at this time because the Russian economy is so uh, fossil fuel dependent, but will it push us faster and more furiously toward getting off of fossil fuel? Oh, it certainly should. I mean, there's an immediate urgency war solution of trying to increase supply so that we don't hurt people at the pump, right? Because it's just a lesson of supply and demand, the more supply you have, the lower you pay. But the medium and long term, it is so clear that for our national security, for our energy security, for our economy, we have got to move away from our reliance on fossil fuels uh, produced in countries that do not have our interests at heart. Europe is feeling this most acutely. They have a huge reliance on Russian, Russian gas in particular, their natural gas. It is it is devastating for them. But it but you know what they've done? They have said this just it really causes us to accelerate toward clean energy. They've been held hostage essentially by Russia because of their reliance on natural gas. They feel that and he has Vladimir Putin has used gas as a weapon against them have tried to hold them hostage over their reliance on natural gas, has tried to use natural gas as a way to divide the allies, divide us from Europe. That his actions have only served to unite us, but it certainly means that they, they and we have an agenda to accelerate dramatically our movement toward clean and our movement away from, from any supply from certainly Russia. Uh, tell me what you have accomplished so far, you and the president, of course, have accomplished so far in terms of pushing us toward a carbon neutral, uh, becoming a carbon neutral country. Yeah, I mean, the great news is that, first of all, you have to start with a goal, right? And the president has a goal 
of getting to 100% clean electricity, meaning zero carbon emitting electricity by 2035, and to cut our CO2 emissions in half by 2030, and to be net zero by 2050. That means we have got to move extremely quickly. Fortunately, the president and Congress agreed on this bipartisan infrastructure law. People think it's just about roads and bridges, but actually it is about a whole suite of clean energy technologies and advancing those technologies. For example, one technology that is does, admits zero CO2 and it is um, a dispatchable clean baseload power is nuclear. So in, in February, um, we announced this uh, request for, we started the process of putting $6 billion worth of civil nuclear credit out onto the street to make sure that our nuclear program still stays uh, in place. 50% right now, a little over 50% of our clean, our zero carbon emission electricity in the United States comes from nuclear. And we want to make sure that that does not uh, go away. We also announced a notice of intent to provide about $3 billion to boost the production of advanced batteries. Of course, those are critical for electric vehicles. Those batteries are going to be absolutely important as we get to our, our goal of electrifying the transportation sector, in addition to also putting out on the street $5 billion, or at least a notice to um, to give guidance to states about the $5 billion that will be made available through that build out of electric charging stations across the country. So the Department of Energy and the Department of, of Transportation have a, a joint office to be able to put that $5 billion out on the street for, for tens of thousands of new charging stations. Um, in February, we announced uh, $9.5 billion for clean hydrogen initiatives. That means hydrogen is a form of energy carrier, energy storage that can help um, renewable energy, if it's clean hydrogen, green hydrogen, to be able to essentially be dispatchable baseload power. Since the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow, you have to make sure that you're able to store energy and hydrogen, clean hydrogen, green hydrogen is a way to do that, as well as to transport that hydrogen. It's super exciting, new technology. A lot of people don't know about it, but every country in the world is looking to that advanced technology to be able to get to our zero uh, carbon emission goals. We just announced another nine and a half billion dollars for, um, excuse me, another in February, another um, uh, call for people to come work for the Department of Energy, a clean energy core, a thousand people we are looking to hire to help us build out these clean hydrogen hubs, the carbon capture hubs, the battery technology. We need engineers, we need project managers, we need people starting, we need people who are in the middle of their career. So that's very exciting, that clean energy core. We announced a whole office realignment in February around deploying, deploying, deploying all this clean energy. We got a whole building a better grid initiative. I know I could go on and on. I'm sorry, this is such a long <laughs> no, answer. But I'm telling you, we are... We are on it and we are rocking and rolling to be able to build a, a cleaner uh, energy system in the U.S. But one of the major uh, American auto producers, not Tesla, but uh, one of them uh, recently announced that they plan to be, make, be making one third of their fleet uh, electric vehicles by, I believe it was 2030. Uh, Is that quickly think, enough? Uh, I think it's theirs. If you're looking at Stellantis, perhaps theirs is by 2025, and they want to get 50% of theirs uh, to be electric by 2030, as do all of the other um, uh, auto companies. They are all saying 50% by 2030 of their new sales will be electric. Super exciting. Now we also have to get this semiconductor chip shortage resolved so that they can actually build all of these on the scale and speed with that is necessary to decarbonize our transportation system. The transportation system right now is about a third of our carbon pollution that goes up into the air. So we need to decarbonize. And my favorite thing ab about this is that the if you drive an electric vehicle, especially when you consider these outrageous gas prices today, if you, drive, if you have a 15 gallon tank, which is the average size of a tank today, and you went to fill it up on average, if you had the, paid the average gas price across the country, which is about $3.80, you'd be paying 54 bucks to fill up your tank. That's 54 bucks. If you had an electric vehicle that would take you the same distance, about 300 miles, and you plugged it in at home, it would cost you about 12 bucks. 
54 versus 12. That is a huge savings every time you fill up your car. So I'm just saying that the, the, the movement to electrifying our transportation system, to resolving greenhouse gas emissions and climate change, and it will also put money in people's pockets. And that's very exciting too. Uh, now let's talk, I want to talk a little bit more about nuclear because uh, obviously it at least used to be controversial. There haven't been uh, any major accidents at nuclear power plants recently. Um, but uh, Europe does have a lot more nuclear power than we do, correct? France in particular has a lot of nuclear power as well as the Eastern Bloc European uh, countries do. Germany, uh, not so much, but there is a great openness. I mean, France recognizes that nuclear power is dispatchable, baseload, clean power, and it, it's very reliable. And so they have really doubled down on it. We are, you know, our Department of Energy, obviously, we, we have a national security mission, which is that we maintain the nuclear stockpile that's on the weapons side. But on the nuclear power side, with power plants to be able to allow you to turn on your lights, we also have an office that is focused on that. And the technologies associated with next generation nuclear are really exciting. These smaller modular reactors, they can, there, there's even uh, micro reactors, these advanced technologies that create less less waste, nuclear spent nuclear fuel, as well as create that kind of power. They're much less expensive. Um, that is, you know, really promising technology that I think a lot of, I know a lot of countries are also looking at. They're looking at uh, to buy from the United States as well as the U.S. deploying those technologies. Um, now, also, you mentioned the, the chips that are necessary in electric vehicles. And, of course, the country, the biggest supplier by far in the world is Democratic Republic of the Congo, with, Congo, which is involved in a civil war. Um, and then the second largest supplier of cobalt is Russia. So what are we going to do to get the amount of cobalt we need to keep this transition to electro electric vehicles right. going? So yeah, great question. I mean, cobalt is actually used in the batteries. Um, we, we need chips as well. And obviously, we want to make sure we do that. But cobalt, lithium, they're used for the batteries for the electric vehicles. Those are the uh, critical materials, the critical minerals that are associated with making a battery run. Uh, this is why what the president has done in his State of the Union, you heard it, he's really emphasized building out American supply chains for these technologies. And so, you know, cobalt, uh, not only is it in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and they use also child labor for the extraction of their minerals. So it's not only in a distant place, uh, but they also have human rights violations associated with it. And we know China has, has similar issues, certainly with respect to their solar uh, supply chain as well. We want to build this all out in the U.S. We have stood by for the past two decades and watched other countries have a strategic plan to be able to poach our manufacturing sector, providing huge incentives for them to go locate there, um, you know, using slave labor, essentially, uh, to be able to pay for for it and to make it super cheap. This president has said, no, we are not gonna do that. We are gonna partner with business. We are gonna to help to make it uh, profitable for them to locate here. And we're gonna do the whole supply chain here. So now, but when you're, you're talking about refineries, the, the equivalent for batteries of refineries making them here. Uh, we're you're not talking, talking about, about harvesting cobalt from American soil. No, I'm, we're talking about the soup to nuts. I mean, so cobalt, I mean, there are places in the U.S. and in North America that have cobalt uh, deposits as well as lithium deposits. We're also, because um, the Department of Energy is so involved in technology, we have 17 national labs, we are looking deeply at substitute materials for cobalt so that we don't have to rely so much on that type of uh, material, which is more expensive and rarer. But let me just say that we believe that we, you know, mining has been controversial because it hasn't been done in a, an environmentally sustainable way in the past as much. I mean, there are some companies that do, there are some uh, that have been following best practices, but for the most part, there's been a lot of environmental degradation associated with mining. Can you do it in a sustainable way? Yes, you can. So for example, uh, in, in um, uh, California, in the Salton Sea, 
they are extracting lithium from geothermal brines and they are doing it in an environmentally sustainable way where the whole community is on board and there is no degradation uh, that you would see from extracting lithium perhaps in another way. So we are very focused on doing the whole thing soup to nuts. And that also means responsible processing. We don't do any processing of any of these minerals, to your point. We, it is all done. I mean, China does the vast majority of it. So can we do processing in an environmentally sustainable, sustainable way? You bet we can. And so let's just, let's do that here. And by the way, create an entire market for, for environmentally sustainable minerals that are processed, batteries that the rest of the world can buy because they're all in the same pickle too. They don't want to necessarily buy from countries that are, have human rights violations, environmental violations. They're looking for ways to be able to acquire these products, the full, full uh, product like a battery uh, from countries that are doing it well. And we can do that. We can use it here. We can stamp it made in America and we can export it as well. When you talk about uh, trying to find better materials, cleaner materials to use. Where, t tell me about the trajectory for that. Where, where is this going on in the U.S. and when yeah, do you expect to get results? Yeah, it's actually going on in our laboratories. So the Department of Energy has, as I say, 17 national laboratories who all have specializations. And so the, um, the movement toward finding substitutes for materials that are more difficult uh, is happening in about half of the labs uh, that, that we have in the United States, uh, all across the country. And there are some really promising um, technologies that are coming out of these. We have a whole critical uh, minerals initiative that is done, for example, in in Idaho, where they're looking at all these substitutes that are much cheaper. This is true, by the way, for, um, for batteries, the large scale batteries as well, for example, it's one thing to put lithium in a battery for a car because you have a smaller battery. But what if you want to store energy from utilities who are, who are putting up solar panels and wind turbines and you want to make sure you capture that and store it? That's called utility scale storage. And that those are much bigger batteries. And that means that they would have to use a lot more lithium or cobalt. And you don't want to do that because it'd be too expensive. So what are some of the substitutes? So for example, there's really interesting research going on on iron batteries or on batteries from salt from the ocean. There's just really interesting and very promising research that's being done. It's one of the reasons why we call the Department of Energy the solutions department. We have a big, hairy, audacious goal to reduce the cost of storage from utility scale, uh, from utility scale storage by 90%. And uh, that's a lot of that work is being done in the labs. All right, thank you for that. I wanna switch what time we have left over to a very different topic, which is diversity in STEM careers because you've been such an advocate for women's rights throughout your career. Um, tell me what, what is the department doing about getting more women into STEM careers and people of color? Yes. Um, well, first of all, the president has, a, uh, you know, in this bipartisan infrastructure law, the Department of Energy has, is responsible for $62 billion, right? And that $62 billion has to be filtered through a process called Justice 40, which means that 40% of the benefits from these investments have to go to communities that should be at the front of the line. So to your point about, about diversity and making sure that communities are brought along, there is a big push uh, to be able to do that. With respect to women and uh, minorities in STEM, hugely important to have a workforce that looks like America. So in the US, for example, women, make up about 27% of the STEM workforce and less than one third of the clean energy workforce. We wanna increase those numbers. We know that in order to you know, tackle the climate crisis and create our, you know, our, our own clean energy future, we need innovative localized solutions, but we've gotta have diverse perspectives and experiences at the table and women need to be equally represented. And this is, I mean, we say that we see this in the labs all the time. The scientists know this. There's this um, uh, Kennedy, Kellogg School of Business study and it focused on working teams, right? That the teams make better decisions than individuals. So like, for example, all male teams make better decisions about 58% of the time than individuals. Gender diverse teams make better decisions 73% of the time. 
and teams with all kinds of diversity make better decisions 87% of the time. The more perspectives you have around the table, lo and behold, the more inputs you have, the better outputs you have. And that's true in the scientific arena, and it is true in all aspects of work and play. So the takeaway is that we have got to increase our STEM workforce, and we are doing that by working with HBCUs, with MSIs, with, um, we have a whole effort inside of our labs to be able to go into local schools to pull out uh, women, young women and uh, people of color to be able to expose them to what we're doing in the science, technology, engineering, and math field. So we are really focused on it because it, the climate depends on it. Better solutions depend on it. Now, would you say that uh, becoming an engineer is the career of the future and also a very remunerative career? <laughs> the way, for example, uh, you know, the way to make money, let's face it, if you can patent something or be on a team that patents a new technology for making, for making, you know, replacing lithium or, or whatever uh, the chemical or cobalt. Um, uh, thousand percent. Yeah. I mean, honestly, if I were to start over again, I would definitely go into engineering. I mean, I love all this engineering related to clean energy technologies. It's just so fascinating. And you could, you know, there's all kinds of engineers, there's all kinds of science technology uh, that is happening across the board. But the biggest problems require the researchers, the engineers, the scientists to be able to solve them. And it's so exciting from the most minute thing, the subatomic particles to the biggest issues related to climate modeling. It's just, it's a super exciting and meaningful uh, career path because, you know, in addition to the money, you're, you're doing something really important. And that's why this whole clean energy space is so exciting because it does create all kinds of jobs for all kinds of people. But if you're an engineer, if you're in research, if you're doing the science fields, you um, can do uh, really well by doing good. Because I think, for example, my generation, the careers that uh, a lot of people wanted to go into were uh, becoming a doctor, becoming a lawyer. And then the next generation was uh, technology for sure. Uh, but that field has become quite crowded, not as diverse as it needs to be, but quite crowded. So I'm just wondering if you believe there are more opportunities in particularly engineering when it comes to uh, clean energy? Absolutely, there are. We're recruiting all the time. You know, those thousand people that we're hiring right now, the bulk of them are for engineers. We just, we just need people who are systems thinkers, who know how to solve problems, who are excited about cracking the code or designing. So yes, it is a huge opportunity. I hope you know, I would love for my, I just became a grandmother for the first time. I, I'm hoping that my grandkids, if they're not going to be doctors, <laughs> let's have them go and be engineers because it's also super exciting. Yeah. Uh, well, um, if they're not going to be doctors, it's again, it's not the, it's not the field it was 30, 40 years ago with, with, uh, with, you know, medicine now controlled by the insurance companies and what doctors can do and right, right, getting right. pre-approval, pre et cetera. Um, it seems to be there's, it seems to me there's possibly more creative freedom in engineering. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, you need engineers for all kinds of things, right? So for example, the uh, one of the undersecretaries in our office, her name is Jill Ruby, and she is in charge of our National Nuclear Security Administration. And she is somebody who has been uh, designing solutions in the nuclear space for her entire career. In fact, it's Women's History Month, and I just joined her and our other undersecretary for science, her Dr. Jerry Richmond, and you know she's a PhD doctor, but her whole career has been in the science solutions space. And we were um, across the across the street from my office here in DC is the Smithsonian uh, Institution. And there are all of these, uh, for Women's History Month, there's something called If Then She Can, this exhibit at the Smithsonian, which has 120 3D 
printed statues featuring contemporary women innovators in STEM, and five of the 120 are from our Department of Energy. <laughs> really <laughs> exciting. We have a lot of women leading in the Department of Energy, and they would have it no other way. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Secretary Granholm. It's been a pleasure. Um, and best of luck to you in all those innovations that we desperately need right. in terms of clean energy. Yep, we're going to do it. Thank you so much for having me on. It was fun talking. Same here. All That's right. it for this edition. Let's keep the conversation going on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next time. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Park Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more PBS.